Welcome. I'm Dr. Kristen Ekstrand, a fourth year medical student at Vanderbilt University Medical Center and co-director of the Vanderbilt Program for LGBTI Health. I'm here today with Dr. Scott Leibowitz, head child and adolescent psychiatrist in the Gender and Sex Development Program at the Anne and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago and assistant professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Dr. Leibowitz, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about how resilience and coping are important for LGBT individuals across the lifespan? Resilience and coping um, are really important aspects of LGBT care. Um, helping specifically with adolescents and children perceive how they are perceived in the world can help minimize risk, um, can help minimize um, the way they interact with people who may target them. Um, kids and teenagers mostly are uh, often targets of bullying. Ta they're often victimized in school settings. Um, we aim to help improve self-esteem by helping kids recognize the aspects of their identity that they cannot change are um, things that they should not have to change and things that they should not uh, be upset with, be upset about, um, things that they can integrate into their lives in a healthy way, um, helping them uh, recognize the full spectra of gender expression and sexual orientation, sexual identity um, are okay in this world. And I think that um, it's okay to have kids and teenagers recognize that sometimes they may need to modulate their behaviors when they perceive a dangerous situation. And the goal is not to help them go into the closet per se, um, but it's also to help them not necessarily um, put themselves in a situation where if they perceive someone who may victimize them, someone who may be uncomfortable with these issues, um, that they know when to um, not necessarily put out their aspects of their identity that make others um, feel uncomfortable without inducing shame and without teaching them that that's wrong. So elements of resilience are coping with uh, rejection, coping with victimization, coping with bullying. Um, and in children and adolescents, that's an additional milestone and burden that they have to go through compared to the rest of the population. And I think that um, helping promote resilience is something that can really minimize depression, suicide risk, uh, anxiety, risk-taking behaviors such as substance use, and other behaviors such as you know sexual behaviors that may bring um, more harm to them than good. And when you talk about promoting resilience, can you explain a little bit more about how a clinician can do that for LGBT youth? Okay. Um, how a clinician can promote resilience with, um, in LGBT youth um, involves nuanced assessment and really uh, understanding how kids perceive the world and how kids uh, relate to the world. So for example, some kids may uh, come into a doctor's office and feel um, very closed about who they are and they may not feel comfortable expressing who they are and it's up to the doctor to sense really is, there a, is this child or teenager uh, not sharing aspects of themselves uh, in a way that's true um, or genuine? And I think what a doctor can do is approach all people and all kids in the same way in that um, lack of shock value uh, facial response when asking questions and getting answers questions such as, um, tell me, are there aspects about yourself that you're really comfortable with? Are there aspects about yourself that you might want to change? Um, general questions to help elicit people feeling comfortable um, and responses from doctors when kids give answers that may not make them feel necessarily comfortable. I think uh, those are ways to put pa patients at ease with issues that are making them less comfortable. And then once you've identified um, the way kids or teenagers cope with the world um, and how they feel about themselves, you're better able to understand um, 
and, and adjust how you help them um, deal with situations that are adverse and put them in harm's way. Um, so for a kid who's really closed and, and shy and uh, regressed or, or kind of not able to really uh, open up about their feelings, I would approach that that kid or adolescent in a very different way than someone who comes in who um, is much more outspoken and much more outgoing about those issues, um, seemingly more confident, but may uh, perhaps invite um, situations in the school setting with other people who are not tolerant and other people who are victimizing to target them. So we have to modulate by first understanding how resilient these kids are and how they feel about themselves and how they interact with the rest of the world. And in terms of that interaction with the, the rest of the world, um, what, what are some of the negative coping behaviors that you might see in an, in an individual who is still working on how to promote resilience within themselves or who may be a, a victim of some of these external, um, essentially external stigma? What, what kind of negative coping mechanisms do you see? Um, well, so first I'd like to say there's a spectrum from positive coping mechanisms to negative. And so not to approach um, any one individual um, expecting that they will have negative coping mechanisms. Um, we're here to assess positive coping mechanisms as well as negative coping mechanisms in all of the kids that we see. I would say specifically with the negative coping mechanisms, um, some kids, for example, who may um, have not quite accepted who they are or are experiencing attractions or arousal patterns or have had some same-sex or same-gender uh, sexual behavior experimentation, um, but you don't necessarily share that with someone because they're um, either afraid of uh, you know, being labeled in a certain way or being judged in a certain way. They may keep those thoughts and feelings and behaviors to themselves, um, but in a way that can lead them to um, lead secret lives and do things and not have the confidence enough to negotiate situations that would put them at risk. For example, um, not engaging in protective uh, sexual behaviors. Those are things that some kids who quite don't, aren't able to negotiate these complex situations because they're less comfortable with themselves, that's something that, um, a coping mechanism that's negative that we're trying to work on. On the other hand, for kids who um, may be very confident in who they are, um, they may still engage in some negative coping strategies as well. Um, Many of them have uh, been rejected by their families, rejected by their schools. Um, there's a disproportionate rate of homelessness among these um, LGBT youth. And so I think that um, many of them seek to, um, despite being confident and despite being very comfortable with who they are, uh, many of them may also um, invite um, situations of harm on themselves. They may have to turn to the streets uh, in order to um, get money because they've been rejected by their families. They don't have any money and they can turn to uh, prostitution. They can turn to substance abuse. So as far as negative coping strategies, really it can apply to kids who may be very overtly um, comfortable with who they are, uh, but it, they may also be occurring in kids and, and teenagers who are uh, not necessarily disclosing those thoughts to you. And it's our job to really assess and provide an environment that allows someone to feel comfortable to open up about who they are, what behaviors they engage in, and recognize that in adolescence, identities are rather in flux. And so um, things may change over time without assuming that identities are um, going to change. So that's a complex task. And when you talk about sort of assessing these things, are, are there any validated tools that, that are used for assessment um, of coping strategies in LGBT youth? Um, so validated tools of coping assessment, um, I would say that there's uh, very few instruments per se in the LGBT realm specific to assessing coping strategies in adolescence. We would use the typical um, rating scales that we use, like depression rating scales, anxiety rating scales, substance use 
assessments. There are um, interviews that you know detect the different risk-taking behaviors that are applicable to all kids. I think to ha to, to to have a validated instrument only for LGBT youth and their um, resilience and risk factors. Um, uh, may miss the mark because it actually means that you're only applying it to those youth who you've identified as LGBT when in fact there are many youth out there who, like I said, may not even be feeling or expressing or want to uh, disclose to their provider that they are uh, having these types of attractions and behavior. So th the main answer to that question would be to use validated instruments that you use with all kids in detecting risk behaviors, substance abuse screenings, suicide screenings, in terms of realizing the suicide, suicide ideation risk is much higher for these kids. Um, and, and then knowing yourself and, and recognizing within you as the provider that um, sexuality and gender identity may be underlying causes of these potential risk behaviors uh, based on how that kid feels about themselves. And when you talk about uh, essentially positive coping mechanisms and, mm -hmm. and promoting resilience, what are some strategies that clinicians can use to, to do that within the realm of LGBT youth? Um, so within the realm of adolescents and, and children, I think there's many ways to promote positive coping strategies and to promote resilience. Um, the first is to really understand the psychosocial context in which these youth are really being um, supported. And I think that looking at their family system and understanding their family's values and understanding how individual family members may be responding to them um, and trying to come into uh, a discussion with parents, of course, respecting the confidentiality of the adolescent when, uh, when applicable, but should it be a situation where involving the parents in the discussion on how to support the, their adolescent needs to take place, I think it's really important to um, recognize that one does not necessarily need to go from completely rejecting to completely supportive overnight. Parents go through their own um, feelings about and their own um, stages of, of how they um, understand sexuality in their adolescent. And I think that uh, from a harm reduction standpoint, often for me, I am willing to accept moving a family member from say overtly hostile and rejecting to at least ambivalent or not victimizing of their adolescent. Uh, in some situations, preventing that adolescent from being on the street and instead at least staying in the home where the, the situation is tolerable is actually considered a success. Of course, in other situations, I would want to maximize resilience and pr promote positive coping strategies by bringing families from um, a place of neutral ground into that of a supportive uh, environment. So one way is working with families and parents. Um, other ways might be um, connecting that kid to groups of course, not all areas um, have uh, resources and supports uh, for LGBT youth in their cities, um, but many do. And I think connecting the kids, at least knowing about what's available in a local or regional environment to get kids connected with other kids, whether it be social groups or therapeutic groups. Um, so there are some even transgender specific groups for kids who have that very specific experience. Uh, connecting them to a group of peers to help them understand they're not alone and that this is a common experience, maybe not the majority experience, but a common experience that can really help promote resiliency. And then for kids who are not necessarily connected to cities or groups uh, that have these, these uh, types of in-person resources, there are a lot of online resources that I'm uh, giving kids, um, social media networks, um, I tend to, to have kids uh, always know about the Trevor Project's uh, hotline, which is a 24-7 suicide uh, hotline that really specifically caters to the needs of LGBT youth and understands what they may be going through and why, um, 
they uh, may be experiencing a suicidal ideation specific to aspects of who they are uh, and their sexuality and their gender identity. So from online groups to uh, support groups to working with families, and then I couldn't talk about promoting resiliency and promoting positive coping strategies without addressing schools. I think school climate is a, a very important aspect of LGBT health in terms of adolescents and in children. And I know there are plenty of organizations out there that are working to improve school climates and give curricula a chance to improve, to create a safe space for all kids across development. This is not a high school issue. This is also a middle school issue. This is also an elementary school issue. And it's important for teachers and administrators in schools to realize how to approach gender and how to approach sexuality in a way that doesn't isolate these kids further and intervene specifically when other kids and even parents of other students create situations where um, the identified individual could be targeted. So helping kids navigate their school systems, um, their families, and, and then having a peer support network, I think those are really great ways to um, promote uh, a healthy, uh, positive coping strategies and resilience in, in these kids. And this, does not just, uh, this is not just meant for the behavioral health discipline. This can be extended across disciplines uh, from pediatricians, to nurses, uh, to educators, to psychiatrists, psychologists, really anybody that's serving individuals in a healthcare environment can, um, needs to and can really promote health and positive coping strategies in adolescents. And, and can you provide a, a few examples of these groups that you're talking about within the community that you might refer uh, patients or, or families to that, that work with these issues that LGBT youth face? Well, so for example, I know that um, at least in Chicago, we have, um, you know, we have trans youth groups that, that exist within our own hospital community that we're providing support groups for the adolescents. We have parent groups uh, affiliated with our gender program that they can, uh, that parents can go to, uh, to help talk about uh, their own feelings. I know PFLAG is an organization that many parents seek the help from, and PFLAG is across the country, and they have meetings that um, sometimes are more broad for um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender youth, like parents of those kids, and then there are sometimes more um, smaller, narrower focus, so uh, for parents of, of transgender uh, kids only. I know that there are also sometimes groups of parents who are um, have children who are gender nonconforming, and and a group like that I know for sure exists in Boston, and there are many other groups, online groups that parents can access um, that are run out of some of the gender programs. I think the best way to access what your city specifically has, because I know of only the programs that exist close to where I'm a provider, but the best way is to access the professional organizations um, such as uh, GLMA, the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association, um, the Lesbian and Gay Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Association, LAG Kappa, has many, many uh, identified resources online across the country. Um, I know for sure that the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, or WPATH, is a great way to identify specific uh, providers in various areas who can help connect people to resources. So if you don't know of a group or a resource in your area, I think it's important that a provider turn to the professional medical organizations to identify something that's close to them and or use online resources when those are not available. Well, Dr. Leibowitz, thank you very much for being with us today. I very much appreciate it. Thank you.